political correctness, permeating modern daily life, tedious, dull, and moreover, a taskmaster vying to trip you up. Whatever the topic, however simple or complex, the discourse will be reduced to an accepted or unacceptable way of thinking, and judgment will be passed accordingly. Perhaps you are one of these self-appointed PC judges, then this is for you too. We wouldn't wish to discriminate. Here, Robert and Neil offer a revelatory view of this stultifying ideology and how we can and must cease to be in its servitude. I'm Robert Olds, the director of the Bruges Group. Neil McRae, King's College London. And we're concerned about a virus, a virus in our society, a cultural virus. This is undermining our nation state. It's creating the fragmentation of our society, putting people into interest groups. And it's taking away rational discussion from public discourse, from political discussion. And it's creating hysterical comment in the media. And there's no doubt that identity politics is now having a detrimental effect on society. There's no longer a sense of universal nationhood. And in fact, national identity has been morally devalued. And we saw that very much with the EU referendum and its aftermath. That's why we have put together a book explaining all this called Moralitis, a Cultural Virus. Moralitis is an epidemic of subversive ideology. It's expressed through identity politics and based on moral relativism, which is the idea that what's right for one group is wrong for another. There's plenty of young people who declare themselves to be tolerant when in fact they're actually quite intolerant of ideas that differ from their own, ideas that differ from the orthodoxy. We frequently hear of the increase in food intolerances, but we believe that society is suffering from an allergy to ideas. A common refrain is, you can't say that. Well, this is what we call ideology. This cultural virus, novelitis as we have named it, began with Gramsci an Italian communist theorist who wanted to undermine the traditional institutions in society to make way for state socialism. He wanted to attack the church, to attack family, to attack all kinds of traditional beliefs, to weed the people off their opium, as he saw it, their societal opium, their belief in religion, for instance. He wanted to radically change society and create a year zero. And so he started this long march through the institutions where they're pushing this identity politics. And he launched Moralitis into the world, and now it's taken on a life of its own. And cultural Marxism has often been sold as a freedom movement when it is the very opposite. Cultural Marxism denies people freedom. And we see that with the difficulties there are around what people can do and say. We have a real problem now in our society with curtailments of freedom of speech, curtailments of democracy, curtailments of equality before the law. This virus, moralitis, manifests itself and spreads and becomes contagious through activities it would all be familiar with, such as virtue signaling. But there's a flip side to this. There's also the fear of ostracism where people are afraid, literally afraid, of saying the wrong thing. Why? Because they will be cast out. Moralitis, the cultural virus, now spreads a belief that people fit into identity groups and need to be defined purely as what identity they are in. And in that identity, they then awarded a status as either being an oppressor or one of the oppressed puts people into victim groups or those who are perpetrators of some heinous thought crime. And the philosophy of identity politics is moral relativism. So we no longer have people treated as individuals with equal rights, with equal status. People, as Robert has just said, 
are either in a victim class or a perpetrator class. They're either in an oppressed class or the oppressor class. Now, Robert and I, I'm afraid, are guilty of some of those heinous crimes you mentioned, being what white, male, um, heterosexual, dare I say. And the, these are traits which are afforded the lowest value in identity politics. And identity politics creates a hierarchy. And the hierarchy it, it, it ch is changing all the time. So we've suddenly seen the rise of transgenderism right up that hierarchy, overtaking feminism. And this is what happens with identity politics. You get competing groups, competing demands, continually competing for their position in the hierarchy. And we think this is destructive. We think this is impairing social harmony. So Neil, how does this virus work? How do people become infected? How does it spread and who has caught this virus? Well, of course, people won't see themselves as having this uh, a, an infection. People will see themselves as thinking progressively. People will see themselves as thinking in a modern way. Um, but I think a good illustration of moralitis, a good analogy, is in the um, condition of rabies. In rabies, there is a classic symptom of hydrophobia, where someone cannot face drinking water, even though they are desperately thirsty. Now, I'm using that as an extreme analogy. It's similar to the way people behave who have been infected with moralitis. And a, a good illustration of that is we, we can turn to left-wing comedians for, 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 for this point. When comedians tell a joke and they mention a certain group, perhaps one of the identity groups that we've talked about, there is now a pause before the audience laughs because people with moralitis have to check whether they're permitted to find that joke funny. Yeah, this isn't a laughing matter. The spread of moralitis, the infection of people, they may well think they're being individualistic and actually being very right on with their politics, but actually they've accepted the official authority and the official message of the state. It's actually deeply authoritarian because at the very heart of it is an attack on free speech about what can and what cannot be said. And there's a lot of policies behind this that come out of moralitis, creating difference in groups, creating conflict where there needn't be one, and getting rid of the belief in the nation state, which is arguably the most inclusive mm. political structure that we have. And it's interesting because there used to be a very common saying in public discourse. People would say, it's a free country. Well, it's interesting because cultural Marxists don't really believe in a country. Um, but we also have, more fundamentally, a problem with freedom. So in place of the saying, it's a free country, now people have this knee-jerk reaction, you can't say that. Involving yourself in the world of identity politics and all this entails of oppressor and oppressed groups and perceiving people as being victimised it's actually a very good way of signalling how high you are up the social status. Mm. If you're well off enough, you don't have to be concerned about immigration and how the least well off have had their wages cut, or of course how some areas have been radically changed. You can just up sticks and move behind a gated community or to the leafy suburbs and not be affected by the social consequences of dividing society and of course key attribute of moralitis is being in favour of almost unlimited immigration. So it really, it's a way of differentiating yourself from ultimately the lower strata, less able to deal with the consequences of high pressures on social services. Social advancement in this country rests on being able to ape and reflect and repeat these politically correct mantras. One has to say it or one will not get on. There's a very strong groupthink among the younger generations, which I see very clearly as a lecturer in university. And I would say 
that only a minority of those in that environment are actually active propagators of cultural Marxism, are people who are um, seriously infected with the virus. I think that most of the students are carriers, they do have the symptoms, they are in a world which we might call a social bubble, an echo chamber, where they only hear opinions similar to their own, but also they're told what to think. And John Paul Sartre had quite a lot of this in his philosophy, what he called bad faith, where individual people deny their own freedom because it's easier to hide behind others. It's easier to let others tell you what to do and say. And that is a freedom from responsibility, but a freedom which ultimately puts people in chains. Who are these others who are telling us what to say and what to think? Well, on one hand, the European Union is very much involved in this, sponsoring mm. identity politics, awarding funds and special status to organisations that support their agenda. Governments of all persuasions want to define you, not as a British citizen or not what your needs are, but by what group you want to belong to. This is a tactic from the marketing world that's now gone into political marketing, where you are now decided that you are of one group and you must compete for the attentions of the state and for handouts from the state according to their agenda. And then also, you have corporations. Interestingly, many of these corporations may be in certain ways, rather to the right of politics when it comes to regulation or perhaps their tax liability, which they will naturally want to seek to limit. But at the same time, it gives them an opportunity to virtue signal to Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Mm. They like to align themselves with virtue signaling, yet at the same time follow policies that are not necessarily in your best economic interest, but it gives them the opportunity to say how moral and superior they are. And as Mark Zuckerberg said to the Senate in his inquiry, Silicon Valley is an extremely left-leaning place, but not when it comes to their own economic self-interest. And of course, the concept of left versus right is, is quite problematic. And what we found in, in exploring this um, problem of identity politics and in identifying this condition of moralitis is that a much more meaningful dichotomy is liberal versus authoritarian. Now, it's very interesting that younger people, I think of my students, will think of themselves as liberal. But actually, look at what their student unions do around freedom of speech. Look what their student unions do about democracy. Look at the um, prevailing reaction among the student population to our referendum on, the, on EU membership. So they are not really liberal. In fact, they're becoming increasingly authoritarian. And I think this is a, a major feature of moralitis. It, there's a strong authoritarian streak. It's almost puritanical. Control of what people say, what they think. And I think that this is dehumanizing. I mentioned before about um, people having to pause before they laugh at a joke told by a comedian. I think that there's a, there's a dehumanizing uh, feature of moralitis which deprives people of enjoyment, it deprives people of their ability to interact naturally with others, and it deprives people of finding their place in a, in a harmonious, holistic society. Once people spoke truth to power, now they speak power to truth. Once people, particularly young people, questioned the establishment, now they're often just repeating the mantras that the establishment wants them to say, the uber establishment, just reflecting the official state ideology. But it's not just that. 
anybody who rejects this herd mentality, who rejects being put into one particular identity an oppressor or victim group, people who are contrarians, they're now labelled as being either right-wing or populist or, or even racist, or of course labelled with some other phobe or defined as an ist, defining their whole identity as if they had some unpalatable view. But things are changing. Many have now had enough. Yes, I see in university, I'm seeing what I hope is a vanguard of change. Some younger people who are courageous enough to differ from the uh, groupthink. And what we're doing with this work is by identifying the prevailing um, ideology as a virus, as moralitis, we think that's important because thus far, for all the commentaries there are against identity politics and complaining about moral relativism and where it's taking us, until now, we've never really properly diagnosed the problem. And we have diagnosed it as a cultural illness. And until you make the diagnosis, you can't cure a disease. What we mean by a cultural virus is something that is spread culturally, and therefore the treatment and prevention must also be at a cultural level. And there are antibodies that are emerging within society, within our very culture, that are questioning this, speaking out, and are beginning to set the agenda against this prevailing disease. A good example of an antibody is a YouTube sensation such as Sargon of Akkad. So Sargon of Akkad is described in the mainstream media as right-wing or alt-right. And this is what happens with the contrarians that, um, that Robert's just mentioned, is because they are a threat to the, the, the world order, to the prevailing groupthink, they have to be cast out as devils. But people can go on YouTube and see for themselves that Sargon of Akkad is just a classic libertarian. He's somebody who is fighting for freedom, who wants you and I, who wants younger people to enjoy the freedom that they have or should have in an enlightened society. And I think one of the best champions of liberty is the Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson's work is very much anathema to cultural Marxism and I think a few years ago he would have got nowhere but now there is a big appetite. People are really starting to get fed up of the cur curtailments imposed on their lives. People are finding it too easy to make a mistake, to offend the sensitivities of identity politics. And what Jordan Peterson is telling them is, you're not the one with the problem, it's them. And what we would say is, you're not the one with the problem, it's the people with moralitis. We're exposing this disease. We're telling people that this disease is out there. Moralitis has infected many people, but the change is coming. People are rejecting this. Antibodies are emerging we can prevent this disease taking hold of other people and we can treat those who have already been infected. Some are tough on political correctness and cultural Marxism. We want to be tough on the causes of political correctness. And so can you. We can all choose to think for ourselves, refuse to apologise for imagined accusations. Then focus can be placed on actual wrongdoings we can take steps to recreate a harmonious society. We can choose to have faith in our gut instincts. While it's natural to wish to blend in, get on with life, not rock the boat, this inaction does not forebode well. A powerful few determine and enforce PC, while the busy people are not paying attention. It's high time we wake up, take note, and challenge this highly incorrect dogma of political correctness.